screen now? Our screen now? Yeah, let's go. I'm sorry. No? Beating my nose. Fine. Well, I'm going to start <clears throat> back on 162. In other cases of persons of much evil karma, karmically produced flesh-eating demons bearing various weapons will utter strike, slay, and so on, making a fruitful tumult. A frightful? <laughs> 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 a frightful tumult. They will come upon one as if competing amongst themselves as to which of them should get hold of one. Apparitional illusions, too, of being pursued by various terrible beasts of prey will dawn. Snow, rain, darkness, fierce blasts of wind, and hallucinations of being pursued by many people likewise will come. Okay, I, I interrupted Steve last week when we were talking about this. Were you here, Al, last week when Steve was reading? And we talked a little bit about Al example of fleeing in some of his dreams in life, like he was in Chicago in past life or something like that, and he was, he was a bad man, he was free, fleeing from somebody or whatever. Have any of you ever had fleeing dreams at any time at all in your life you had them, Shad? Well, Dreams of like being chased and stuff was a flame for me. What was chasing you? <clears throat> well, I had him with undead zombies chasing me. What? <laughs> undead zombies? <laughs> undead? Yeah. Oh, like they like so people, people came out of the ground that were zombies and they were chasing you? Uh -huh, Did you see a movie or something? Yeah. Oh, that always <laughs> messes with my head. But I, and then I've had other things that. I've just known are these huge, hideous monsters, but I never see it. I'm just running like hell to get away from it. How long ago was this? I don't know. I've, probably the last one I had was within the last six years. Oh, wow. Years. Have you had, ever had a dream like that? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have? What were you running from? Uh, or being Wild changed? monkeys from outer space. <laughs> 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 no, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> were they large or small? Just a normal sized monkey on little round saucers that were just you know coming after you. Coming after you. The Wizard else? of Oz. Wow. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, Donna? Years and years ago, I used to. I don't know what was chasing me, but I, it's like I just could never. My, I couldn't get my legs to work. I just couldn't get going. Um. You know, this is a very con. These guys aren't exceptions. It's a very con and you probably all of you have been had a. In fact, I probably do when I was a little kid, but I can't remember the specifics of it. But I think everybody has um, a dream that they're being pursued by something, or something's got a hold of them and going to get them. Some, I, I get you. You know, Shekinah's probably had dreams like that already, hasn't she? Something's going to get her. Mm -hmm. Because little kids do that to other kids, don't they? They're going to get you. The big bad wolf is going to get you. You know, all mm -hmm. those kind of little stories <laughs> like that. Uh, and so it's it's probably a common thing. Do they? If, do you know people Al that have had dreams like that or talked about it ever before? Everybody's had them, right? That's how I thought. You, so you've talked to other people that have them, haven't you? Yeah. Okay. And so it's a real common thing, and it's interesting that they write about it um, in here that you're going to have those type of illusions after you die in your essence or spirit. Um, depending upon your propensities and karma. And the way people answered those questions were very interesting, the difference between propensities and karma. And everybody seems to have a different understanding of what those words mean. We'll talk about that later. 
snow, rain, darkness, fierce blasts of wind, and hallucinations of being pursued by many people likewise will come, and sounds as of mountains crumbling down, and of angry overflowing seas, and of the roaring of fire and of fierce winds springing up. Footnote. In the Six Doctrines, a treatise on the practical application of various yogas, which we have translated out of the original Tibetan, there is a parallel passage which amplifies this as follows. If one findeth not the path during the second bardo, during the chonyat bardo, then four sounds called awe-inspiring sounds are heard. From the vital force of the earth element, a sound like that crumbling down of a mountain. From the vital force of the water element, a sound like the breaking of storm-tossed ocean waves. From the vital force of the fire element, a sound as of a jungle of fire. From the vital force of the air element, a sound like a thousand thunders reverberating simultaneously. Herein are described the psychic resultants of the disintegrating process called death as affecting the four grosser elements composing the human body aggregate. The, uh, the ether element is not named because in that element alone, in the ethereal or bardo body, the consciousness principle continues to exist. When these sounds come, one, being terrified by them, will flee before them in every direction, not caring whither one fleeth. But the way will be obstructed by three awful precipices, white and black and red. They will be terror-inspiring and deep, and one will feel as if one were about to fall down them. O nobly born, they are not really precipices. They are anger, lust, and stupidity. There's a footnote. The precipices are karmic illusions, symbolical of the three evil passions, and the falling down them symbolizes the entrance into a womb prior to rebirth. Know at that time that it is the Sid Pabardo in which thou art, invoking by name the compassionate one, praying earnestly thus, O compassionate Lord and my Guru and the precious Trinity, suffer it not that I, so and so by name, fall into the unhappy worlds. Act so as to forget this not. Others who have accumulated merit and devoted themselves sincerely to religion will experience various delightful pleasures and happiness and ease in full measure. But that class of neutral beings, who have neither earned merit nor created bad karma, will experience neither pleasure nor pain, but a sort of colorless stupidity of indifference. O nobly born, whatever cometh in that manner, whatever delightful pleasures thou mayest experience, be not attracted by them, dote not on them. Think, may the Guru and the Trinity be worshipped with these merit-given delights. Abandon all dotings and hankerings. Even though thou dost not experience pleasure or pain, but only indifference, keep thine intellect in the undistracted, state of the meditation upon the great symbol without thinking thou art meditating. Uh, this is very important, this next part. There's a footnote. Non-meditation plus non-distraction, referring to a state of mental concentration in which no thought of meditation itself is allowed to intrude. <laughs> this is the state of samadhi. Mm -hmm. If one thinks one is meditating, the thought alone inhibits the meditation. Hence the warning to to the deceased. Okay, so if you're and so if you're stuck in this um, bardo, and all these things are going on, and all these apparitions are coming towards you and everything, and um, you're wondering whether you should flee, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing a lot of thinking, wouldn't you say, Shad? Going on, yeah. and all these thoughts are, are your your attention being put on all of these things that cause thoughts, <coughs> which just to interpret them causes thoughts. Right. And so you should be during your life learning a meditation of silence, where there is no thought. And everybody who's learned that meditation knows exactly what I'm talking about: the meditation of silence, where there's no thought. But beyond the meditation silence is, is in the silence itself is the feeling of the silence. And that is a meditation. If you can be in the feeling of the silence, you don't even have to think to find it because you're just in it. And so if you practice it during your life, being in the feeling of silence and in the feeling of the smell, the feeling of the smell of the silence and the feeling of that state, 
you, then you don't need to put any attention or anything on any of these things. Once you realize you die, you just go into that feeling and you join with the Buddha and the consort, and it's and you don't have to worry about ending up in one of these worlds, the torturous worlds it talks about above, which none of you will end up in because you can't. You not likely that you'll go backwards, and you're in a pretty good world now. Most likely, you won't go to anything worse than you're in now unless your world is torturous. It's just going to get better. But it can even be better. You can make a great leap forward in your evolution if you can cut loose of a lot of this stuff. Um, the lower plans, I was talking outside to Steve and I was saying, boy, wouldn't it be nice if somebody stopped going to their meditation classes so there wouldn't be peace or there wouldn't be war? You know, that was just a... Uh, slip of the mouth, but it would be nice if you could incarnate into a war that was more peaceful, that had more neutral, that didn't have Vietnams and didn't have Iraqs and didn't have World War Twos or World War Ones or all the things that they've been having on this planet if you could get into a more peaceful state. And that's why your meditations are so important. Did you meant incarnate into a world, not a war? That's what I meant. You're right. I, I knew that I said the wrong word, but I didn't want to back up and correct it. Thank you. Did you say? I said the word war, incarnating into a war. I should have said world that had no war. Oh, nobly born at that time at bridgeheads in temples by stupas of eight kinds. Another footnote. This refers to the eight purposes for which a stupa or pagoda is built. Two such instances may be cited in elucidation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ram Ramyal Choden or stupa is here translatable as object of worship, and the other as victory. Hence, this sort of pagoda is one for marking a victory, a monument. And not the other one refers to a stupa used as a monument for marking the spot where a saint or sage died or the place of burial of the urn containing such a one's ashes. Other pagodas are purely symbolical structures erected as Christian crosses are as objects of worship or veneration. In Ceylon, many stupas are erected solely to enshrine sacred books or relics. The great stupas of northwest India near Peshawar and at Taxila, lately opened, contain bone relics and other objects. Two of them contained authentic bits of the bones of the Buddha. You know, the Catholic Church still does this. Um, and the Catholic Church started doing this about CE0, or one hundred, three hundred years after the death of Christ, when the Romans took it, took it over and they started building the first churches and cathedrals, they took the bone relics of the saints and put them in churches and enshrined cases. And there, the members of the church would go there and meditate with those bone relics. And in the, in the United States alone, there's over seventy enshrinements in Catholic churches and cathedrals within the United States, where there's bodies of saints or holy people in the Catholic Church. And those enshrinements are within the churches themselves, and the bodies are there. And some of them you can see the body, and some of them you can't see the body. But they put them there for the members of the church to come there and meditate with, because of the vibrational state that is with um, the body itself, that, it, that carries over. And so this is a, a practice that um, this book was written 1500 years before Christianity and that practice was going on then and the same practice happened in Egypt and I think all of the religions probably took it from the ancient Egyptian um, mummification processes and the worshipping of those um, saints in the Egyptian religion. So the Greek Orthodox does it too. Um, they have a saint in Canada. I was talking to some funeral directors. They have, and then they have one in the United States back east. Um, 
a saint inside the Greek Orthodox Church. And I'm sure some of the other churches do. I know the, the Buddhist churches all do have um, the, the um, mummified bodies of the lamas inside their pagodas so that their members of the Buddhist church can go there or the Buddhist temple can go there and meditate with them because part of their essence stays with their mummified body and they're the saints of the Buddhist religion, the saints of the Catholic religion, the saints of the Greek Orthodox. Hindus, I don't think they do it. They could, and I don't know about it. Who nobly born at that time at bridgeheads in temples by stupas of eight kinds, thou wilt rest a little while, but thou wilt not be able to remain there very long. For thine intellect hath been separated from thine earth plane body. Another footnote. Like a person traveling alone at night along a highway, having his attention arrested by prominent landmarks, great isolated trees, houses, bridgeheads, temples, stupas, and so on, the dead, in their own way, have similar experiences when earth wandering. They are attracted by karmic propensities to familiar, to familiar haunts in the human world but being possessed of a mental or desire body cannot long at, remain long at any one place. As our text explains, they are driven hither and thither by the winds of karmic desires, like a feather before a gale. Because of this inability to loiter, thou oft times wilt feel dis perturbed and vexed and panic-stricken. At times thy knower will be dim, at times fleeting and co incoherent. Thereupon this thought will occur to thee, Alas, I am dead, what shall I do? And because of such thought the knower will become saddened and the heart chilled, and thou wilt experience infinite misery of sorrow. Footnote. It should be remembered here that all the terrifying phenomena and the unhappiness are entirely karmic. Had the deceased been developed spiritually, his bardo existence would have been peaceful and happy from the first, and he would not have wandered down so far as this. The Bardo Thodol is concerned chiefly with the normal individual and not with highly developed human beings whom death sets free into reality. So most of you probably won't have to be worrying about this state. You would have made it with the Buddha and the consort earlier in this, because I know you're such developed beings, right? And you're practicing your meditations um, diligently and you are unloading most of your propensities right out. Alright? Alright. Isn't that everybody's doing that, aren't they, Shad? And so you don't have to really be worried about this. Although, if you get this far, um, you might remember at this point that you're supposed to stop thinking. And, <laughs> and don't follow those little um, fairies off into the bushes or whatever, you know, at this point. Looking for um, gold and stuff like that, or the pleasures of the world, um, what you want to do is jump on one of the Buddhas and make sure you give them, have you given the Buddha food while you were alive. Okay. Since thou canst not rest in any one place and feel impelled to go on, think not of various things, but allow the intellect to abide in its own unmodified state. As to food, only that which hath been dedicated to thee can be partaken of by thee, and no other food. Footnote. Like fairies and spirits of the dead, according to Celtic belief, or the demons of ancient Greek belief, the dwellers in the bardo are said to live on invisible ethereal essences, which they extract either from food offered to them on the human plane, or else from the general s storehouse of nature. In the six doctrines already referred to above, there is this reference to the inhabitants of the bardo. They live on odor, odors, or the spiritual essences of material things. And like we mentioned last week, everybody who's been into a Buddhist restaurant sees the Buddha sitting there, and there'll be like an orange and an apple and a banana and stuff like that sitting in front of the little Buddha statue. Have you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is those people who are Buddhist, most of them are, that have the Asian restaurants, they're making food offerings of, of the food and it, it dehydrates and 
dies after all, but the essence of it goes to the to the ruler Buddha on the other side, and they consume those essences of those foods, and so they are they're making offerings. Do they do this in the Catholic Church someplace? Make offerings of food to the deceased that you know of? Or I can think of. Now they did it in the Egyptian writings. Um, they take they took it to the tombs of the Egyptian saints and or the relatives that passed on and gave left offerings um, at the door of the tomb. There was they drew a door like on the entrance to the tomb. It wasn't it was carved in there and you like you could swing the door open and go in there and talk to them and they could come out and pick up the essence of the food and take it back into the tomb with them. The reason the door was As to friends at this time, there will be no certainty. There's a footnote. Friends may or may not exist in the intermediate state as on earth. <laughs> but even if they do, they are powerless to counteract any bad karma of the deceased. He must follow his own path as marked out by karma. These are the indications of the wandering about on the Siddha Bardo of the mental body. At the time, happiness and misery will depend upon karma. Thou wilt see thine own home, the attendants, relatives, and the corpse, and think, Now I am dead, what shall I do? And being oppressed with intense sorrow, the thought will occur to thee, Oh, what would I not give to possess a body? And so thinking, thou wilt be wandering hither and thither, thinking about seeking a body. Even though thou couldst enter thy dead body nine times over, owing to the long interval which thou hast passed in the Chunyad Bardo, it will have been frozen if in winter, then decomposed if in summer, or otherwise thy relatives will or wait thy relatives will have cremated it, or interred it, or thrown it into the water, or given it to the birds and beasts of prey. And there's a footnote. All known forms of disposal of a corpse are practiced in Tibet, including mummification. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, finding no place for thyself to enter into, thou wilt be dissatisfied and have the sensation of being squeezed into cracks and crevices amid amidst rocks and boulders. Footnote. This symbolizes the getting into undesirable wombs, such as those of human beings of animal animal like nature. The experiencing of this sort of misery occurs in the intermediate state when seeking rebirth. Even though thou seekest a body, thou wilt gain nothing but trouble. Put aside the desire for a body and permit thy mind to abide in the state of resignation and act so as to abide therein. By thus being set face to face, one obtaineth liberation from the bardo. The Judgment Instructions to the Efficient Yet again, it may be possible that because of the influence of bad karma, one will not recognize even thus. Therefore, call the deceased by name and speak as follows, O nobly born, so and so, listen. Thou, that thou art suffering so cometh from thine own karma. It is not due to anyone else's. It is by thine own karma. Accordingly, pray earnestly to the precious Trinity that will protect thee. If thou neither prayest nor knowest how to meditate upon the great symbol, nor upon any tutelary deity, the good genius, there's a footnote, simultaneously born God or good spirit or genius, the personification of a human being's higher or divine nature, popularly known as Sikkimese, in Sikkimese as light, little white God, who was born simultaneously with thee, will come now and count out thy good deeds with white pebbles and the evil genius, and that is simultaneously born demon, the personification of a human being's lower or carnal nature, popularly known in Sikkimese as little black demon, who was born simultaneously simultaneously with thee will come and count out thy evil deeds with black pebbles. Thereupon thou wilt be greatly frightened, awed, and terrified. Yeah, if somebody shows up counting black pebbles, <laughs> take note. 
Is that like the devil on one side and the angel on the other that they always depict? Yeah. The white one and the black <laughs> one, they just, you know, give it an yeah. opposite side. Yeah, right. Take notes. You better stop thinking right away. Don't pay attention to our little black pebbles. <laughs> you better start meditating at that point. You don't want to get your mind on the little black pebbles. I know none of you will get this far. You know, so you don't have to worry about it. But just in case, we well, want to avoid them. <laughs> Thereupon, thou wilt be greatly frightened, awed, and terrified, and wilt tremble. And thou wilt attempt to tell lies, saying, I have not committed any evil deed. I've heard people <laughs> Time to fess up. <laughs> then the Lord of Death will say, I will consult the mirror of karma. So saying, he will look in the mirror, wherein every good and evil act is vividly reflected. Lying will be of no avail. Then one of the executive furies of the Lord of Death will place round thy neck a rope and drag thee along. You, can I ask a question, Bernie? Do you think that there are people that try to talk their way out of it at this point? No. You think that their that their mind starts chattering in the point, you know, saying, "Well, I didn't, but I did, you know, but I did it for and didn't." And da -da -da -da. Well, I think what happens is, you know, fear is coming up and got them all anxious and nervous and their just mind is just like no one like band and their lips are I mean their mental lips are flapping and they're saying I didn't do it and not me and it wasn't me it was somebody else and all those kinds of things can you see that going on mm -hmm. pretty interesting isn't it wow won't do any good at this point they started counting the black pebbles he will cut off thy head, extract thy heart, pull out thy intestines, lick up thy brain, drink thy blood, eat thy flesh, and gnaw thy bones. Number two, these tortures symbolize the pangs of the deceased's consciousness, conscience. For the judgment, as herein described, symbolizes the rising up of the good genius in judgment against the evil genius, the judge being the conscience itself in its stern aspect of impartiality and love of righteousness. The mirror is memory. One element, the purely human element, of the consciousness content of the deceased comes forward and, by offering lame excuses, <laughs> tries to meet accusations against it, saying, owing to such and such circumstances, <laughs> I had to do so and so. Oh, no, it's in there. <laughs> Whoa, these guys got it all. Yeah, they're You've seen people do that in life, haven't you? Especially parents see their kids doing it. And you, you know, when you catch them when they're candy, hand in the cookie jar. Have you ever had your hand in the cookie jar? You have. Oh, oh. okay. Another element of the consciousness content comes forward and says, you were guided by such and such motives. Your deeds partake of the black color. Then some more friendly one of such elements arises and protests. But I have such and such justification, and the deceased deserves pardon on these grounds. As so, as the lamas, and so, as the lamas explain, the judgment proceeds. But thou wilt be incapable of dying. Although thy body be hacked to pieces, it will revive again. The repeated hacking will cause intense pain and torture. Even at the time that the pebbles are being counted out, be not frightened nor terrified. Tell no lies and fear not the Lord of death. Thy body being a mental body is incapable of dying even though beheaded and quartered. In reality, thy body is of the nature of voidness. Footnote meaning that the astral or desire body is incapable of ordinary physical injury. As through a cloud, a sword can be plunged through the bardo body without harming it, the lamas explain, or it is like the forms seen in, the mater in materializing seances of neo oh, necromancers, ne 
necromancers, and spirit mediums. Hmm. Okay. In reality, thy body is of the nature of voidness. Thou needst not be afraid. The lords of death are thine own hallucinations. And there's a footnote. These lords of death are Yamaraja and his court of associates, including perhaps the executive furies. These last are as tormenting furies comparable to the humanities of somebody, the great drama, elements of one's own consciousness content. Following the Abhidhamma of Southern Buddhism, there are mind and impulses of mind, and the impulses of mind are the furies. Thy desire body is a body of propensities and void. Voidness cannot injure voidness. The qualityless cannot injure the qualityless. Apart from one's own hallucinations, in reality there are no such things existing outside oneself as Lord of Death, or God, or Demon, or the bull-headed spirit of death. Uh, footnote, bull-headed spirit of death commonly depicted as having a buffalo head. The chief tutelary deity of the Gal Galupa or Yellow Hat sect, meaning the destroyer of the Lord of Death, is often represented as a blue buffalo-headed deity. Act so as to recognize this. At this time, act so as to recognize that thou art in the bardo. Meditate upon the samadhi of the great symbol. If thou dost not know how to meditate, then merely analyze with care the real nature of that which is frightening thee. In reality, it is not formed into anything, but is a voidness, which is the dharmakaya. Footnote. Oh, no. That voidness is not of the nature of the voidness of nothingness, but a voidness at the true nature of which thou feelest odd, and before which thine intellect shineth clearly and more lucidly. That is the state of mind of the Sambhogakaya. In that state, wherein thou art existing, there is being experienced by thee in an unbearable intensity, voidness and brightness inseparable, the voidness bright by nature, and the brightness by nature void, and the brightness inseparable from the voidness, a state of the primordial or unmodified intellect, which is the adhikaya, synonymous with dharmakaya. And the power of this, shining unobstructively, will radiate everywhere. It is the nirmanakaya. O nobly born, listen unto me undistractedly. By merely recognizing the four kayas, Thou art certain to obtain perfect emancipation in any of them. Be not distracted. The line of demarcation between Buddhas and sentient beings lieth herein. Footnote. In virtue of knowing the true nature of sensoric existence, that all phenomena are unreal, Buddhas are perfectly enlightened ones, are, being, are beings quite apart from unenlightened sentient beings. Where was I? No, no, what? Okay. This moment is one of great importance. If thou shouldst be distracted now, it will re it require innumerable eons of time for thee to come out of the quagmire of misery. Footnote. There will be no time when thou canst get out. A saying, the truth of which is applicable, is in a moment of time a marked differentiation is created. In a moment of time, perfect enlightenment is obtained. Till the moment which hath just passed, all this bardo hath been dawning upon thee, and yet thou hast not recognized, because of being distracted. On this account thou hast experienced all the fear and terror. Shouldst thou become distracted now, the cords of divine compassion of the compassionate eyes will break, and thou wilt go into the place where from which there is no immediate liberation. There's a footnote. This is a little literal rendering, meaning that the rays of grace or compassion of Chenrazi will cease to dawn. Therefore, be careful. Even though thou hast not recognized ere this, despite thus being set face to face, thou wilt recognize and obtain 
liberation here. <clears throat> Instructions to the efficient. If it be an illiterate boor who knoweth not how to meditate, then say this, O nobly born, if thou knowest not how thus to meditate, act so as to remember the compassionate one and the sangha, the dharma, and the buddha, and pray. Think of all these fears and terrifying apparitions as being thine own tutelary deity or as the compassionate one. Footnote. The idea meant to be conveyed is that trials and tribulations, although karmic, act as divine tests, and so, being for the good of the deceased, ought even to be visualized as such, as the tutelary deity or as Chenrazi. Bring to thy recollection the mystic name that hath been given thee at the time of thy sacred initiation when thou wert a human being and the name of thy guru and tell them to the righteous king of the lords of death. Footnote. This revealing of the initiatory name is for the purpose of establishing a cult connection between the deceased and the king of death, between the human and the divine in man, in much the same way as Freemason will make himself known to another Freemason by giving some secret password. Even though thou fallest down precipices, thou wilt not be hurt. Avoid awe and terror. The all-determining influence of thought. Instructions to the efficient. Say that, for by such setting face to face, despite the previous non-liberation, liberation ought surely to be obtained here. Possibly, however, liberation may not be obtained even after that setting face to face, and earnest and continued application being essential, again calling the deceased by name speak as follows. O nobly born, thy immediate experiences will be of momentary joys followed by momentary sorrows of great intensity, like the taut and relaxed mechanical actions of catapults. That is to say, at one time good karma will be operative and raise the deceased to a spiritual state of mind, and at another time bad karma becoming predominant, the deceased will be pulled down in mental depression. The operator of the catapult is karma, who stretches out the catapult to its limit and then relaxes it alternatively. alternately. Be not in the least attached to the joys, nor displeased by the sorrows of that. If thou art to be born on a higher plane, the vision of that higher plane will be dawning upon thee. Thy living relatives may, by way of dedication for the benefit of the de of thee deceased, be sacrificing many animals. Footnote. Each time an animal is sacrificed, presumably to be prepared for food afterwards, the deceased is said to be unable to escape the karmic result the sacrifice being done in his name, so that horrors come upon him directly. <laughs> wow. He calls to the living to cease, but they not hearing him, he is inclined to grow angry, and anger he must avoid at all costs, for if allowed to arise on the Bardo plane, like a heavy weight it forces him down to the lowest mental state called hell. Animal sacrifice to the dead in Tibet, as in India, originated in ancient times far prior to the rise of Buddhism, which of course prohibits it. Survivals of it have persisted in Tibet, but without the approval of the lamas, as our text clearly proves, and if practiced nowadays, it is only rarely and by the rude folk of remote districts who are Buddhist merely in name. Save for the yogi or lama eager for the highest spiritual development, with which the flesh eating is said to be incompatible, Tibetans being confirmed eaters of animal corpses, like the Brahmins of Kashmir, who are consequently not recognized as Brahmins by the pure living Bo Brahmins of India, excuse their meat eating on the grounds of climatic and economic necessity. Although unconscious attempt to uncover upper racial predisposition inherited from nomadic and pastoral ancestors for a flesh diet. Even in Ceylon, where there can be no such excuse for Buddhists to disobey the precept prohibiting the taking of life, flesh eating has already been rapid, has made rapid progress since the advent of Christianity, which, unlike Buddhism, does not, unfortunately, teach kindness to animals as a religious tenet. 
St. Paul himself being of a opinion that God cares not for oxen. And yet on Ceylon's sacred mount of Mintali still stands as witness of a pure Buddhism, the ancient edict cut on a stone slab prohibiting, as the edicts of Asoka prohibit, the slaying of any animal either in sacrifice or for food. And performing religious ceremonies and giving alms. Thou, because of thy vision not being purified, mayst be inclined to grow very angry at their actions and bring about at this moment thy birth in hell. Whatever those left behind thee may be doing, act thou so that no angry thought can arise in thee and meditate upon love for them. Furthermore, even if thou feelest attached to the worldly goods thou hast left behind, or because of seeing such worldly goods of thine in the possession of other people and being enjoyed by them, thou shouldst feel attached to them through weakness or feel angry with thy successors. That feeling will affect the psychological moment in such a way that, even though thou wert dis destined to be born on higher and happier planes, thou wilt be obliged to be born in hell or in the world of pretas or unhappy ghosts. On the other hand, even if thou art attached to worldly goods left behind, thou wilt not be able to possess them, and they will be of no use to thee. Therefore abandon weakness and attachment for them, cast them away wholly, renounce them from thy heart. No matter who may be enjoying thy worldly goods, have no feeling of miserliness, but be prepared to renounce them willingly. Think that thou art offering them to the precious trinity and to thy guru and abide in the feeling of unattachment devoid of weakness of desire again when any recitation of the mantra this mantra is believed to have the magical power of so transmuting food sacrificed to the dead as to make it acceptable to them is being made on thy behalf as a funeral rite or when any right for the absolving of bad karma liable to bring about thy birth in lower regions is being performed for thee, the sight of their being conducted in an, in an incorrect way, mixed up with sleep and distraction and non-observance of the vows and lack of purity on the part of any efficient, and such things indicating levity, all of which thou wilt be able to see because thou art endowed with limited karmic power of Prescience, and there's a footnote. In its fullness, this power of prescience includes knowledge of the past, present and future, the ability to read others' thoughts, and the unobstructed knowing of one's own capabilities and limitations. Only highly developed beings, such, for example, as adepts in yoga, enjoy such complete power of prescience. On the bardo plane, unlike the human world, Every being possesses, in virtue of freedom from the impeding gross physical body, a certain degree of the power, as the text makes clear. Thou mayst feel lack of faith and entire disbelief in thy religion. Thou wilt be able to apprehend any fear and fright, any black actions, irreligious conduct, and incorrectly recited rituals footnote, that is, fear and fright, or impropriety, or carelessness on the part of any person conducting the funeral rites. In thy mind thou mayst think, alas, they are indeed playing me false. Thinking thus thou wilt be extremely depressed, and through great resentment thou wilt acquire disbelief and loss of faith, instead of affection and humble trustfulness. This affecting the this affecting the psychological moment, thou wilt be certain to be born in one of the miserable states. Such thought will not only be of no use to thee, but will do thee great harm. However incorrect the ritual and improper the conduct of the priests performing thy <laughs> funeral rites, think, what, mine own thoughts must be impure. How can it be possible that the words of the Buddha should be incorrect? It is like the reflection of the blemishes on mine own face, which I see in a mirror. Mine own thoughts must indeed be impure. As for thee, the priest, the sangha in their body, the dharma their utterance, the dharma their utterance, 
and in their mind they are the Buddha in reality. I will take refuge in them. Thus thinking, put thy trust in them and exercise sincere love. Do we want to stop? Okay. Close. Huh. Mickey and Brian were on. Oh, great, you guys. Thanks. Good.